Do you want to know the two forms that are responsible for all evil on this earth? It's very basic. It starts with our psychology, and it ends up into our physical reality. Of course, there are many fields of study involved with this, but to deduce it to two simple forms, not many historians have really looked at this. But I challenge you to look at this, because this is a common trend among speakers like Mahatma Gandhi and Bob Marley and Martin Luther King Jr., just for some examples. And these individuals all in their country helped people free their own minds and free their own living condition. This isn't a coincidence. They spoke of an idea called mental slavery, and that is the condition of unquestionable or self-induced servitude, not being able to reason and think for yourself. And this is also known as internal slavery. It is the condition of mind control or menticide, leading to and maintaining physical slavery or external slavery, and therefore it is the root cause to all slavery, which then may also be referred to as the most dangerous form. Many slaves are trained into thinking they are meant to be slaves, as it would be unquestionable for them having a reality without it. Ask yourself, are you trained into thinking you should be something, when in reality you may not be? Similarly, those who are pro-slavery convince themselves that slavery for others is a necessity, creating cognitive dissonance and embracing inequality. Therefore, mental slavery is where freedom is feared and security dependence is embraced. It would be normal for the slave to have a lack of responsibility over their own property as it wasn't recognized and embraced as their own. It instead belonged to their master, they truly believed it. Visible violence or physical slavery isn't necessary if the slave complies on their own and becomes convinced of their own slavery and lack of need in freedom. In other words, the individual assumes their property, their life, their freedom, their ownership, their responsibility simply is being a slave. It's the only life they know they cannot imagine a life without it, for they were perhaps raised in that condition. The condition of visible violence based compliance for servitude is known as physical slavery or external slavery, and whether the slave is mentally a slave or not, violence will ensure that the slave becomes mentally enslaved through the trauma of fear. However, this trauma and fear does not need to occur or persist, and thus physical slavery always depends on mental slavery. Therefore, physical slavery is the outward expression and manifestation of mental slavery. Simply so, the abolitionists, those who want to end slavery, recognized that by empowering slaves both mentally and physically, but mainly mentally, they can no longer be a slave. Mahatma Gandhi said freedom and slavery are mental states. The moment the slave resolves that he will no longer be a slave, his fetters fall. He frees himself and shows the way to others. Martin Luther King Jr. said, As long as the mind is enslaved, the body can never be free. Psychological freedom and a firm sense of self-esteem is the most powerful weapon against a long night of physical slavery. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation or Kennedyan or Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can totally bring this kind of freedom. He's quite literally saying here that legislation cannot truly free individuals. Isn't that an interesting insight here? He goes on and actually shares quite a lot of insight about physical slavery and after the Civil War, and even sharing insights from Egypt, Israel, and other places of the world and in history. He says that slavery in America was perpetrated not merely by human badness, but also by human blindness. 
and he even shares a reference to Kenneth Stamp in his book, The Peculiar Institution, where he looks at slavery and how the mentality of slavery has existed. Uh, of course, it included unconditional submission, innate inferiority, uh, using fear, the master's code of good behavior, dependence, and clothing acts uh, that are evil in a sense of righteousness. And he says the haunting ambivalence, the intellectual and moral recognition that slavery is wrong, but the emotional tie to the system so deep and pervasive, it imposes an inflexible unwillingness to root it out. So just showing you how deeply entrenched, indoctrinated slaves were into their own slavery. And again, the same can be said for slave masters or anybody who promoted such systems. So what does that tell us about systems today? Is it possible that people are kind of stuck into a cognitive dissonance, unable to see a reality beyond it? Bob Marley said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Marcus Aurelius, coming from a different perspective, says, stop allowing your mind to be a slave, to be jerked by selfish impulses, to kick against fate and the present, and to mistrust the future. See, is there mistrust? Is there insecurity? What are those deeper psychological elements? We'll keep talking about these. Robert A. Heinlein, an author, said, Mighty little force is needed to control a man whose mind has been hoodwinked. Contrawise, no amount of force can control a free man, a man whose mind is free. No, not the rack, not fission, bombs, not anything. You can't conquer a free man. The most you can do is kill him. And Gandhi even has similar quotes to this. This is why he was willing to go to jail for his beliefs. And that bravery ended up with his success. Seneca, another philosopher, said slavery takes hold of few, but many take hold of slavery. So isn't that interesting that many are actually wanting or grabbing on to slavery? It's not happening to them. Wade Horn, a psychologist, said if we are going to abolish modern day slavery, then we have to put the traffickers out of business. That's going to demand, unfortunately, the cooperation of the victims. So why are the victims having to do something here unless they are also part of the problem? Dresden James, an author, said the ideal tyranny is that which is ignorantly self-administered by its victims. The most perfect slaves are, therefore, those which blissfully and unawaredly enslave themselves. Rudolf Steiner, a philosopher, said only when they enslave my mind and spirit and drive my own impulses to action from my head and want to replace them with theirs, do they intend my inner unfreedom. Whoever wants to eradicate the pleasure of satisfying human desires must first make the human being into a slave who does not act because he wants to, but only because he ought. Luke D. Clapiers, a philosopher, said servitude debases men to the point where they end up liking it. Clarence Lee Swartz said habits of unthinking obedience may be trained in the individuals that will bring their social behavior close to slavery. Slavery in one sense voluntary because the spirit of self-determination will have been crushed out or conditioned. So again, the slave wanting their slavery. H. L. Mencken said, I believe that it is better to be free than to be not free, even when the former is dangerous and the latter safe. I believe that the finest qualities of man can flourish only in free air. That progress made under the shadow of the policeman's club is false progress and of no permanent value. I believe that any man who takes the liberty of another into his keeping is bound to become a tyrant, and that any man who yields up his liberty in however slight the measure is bound to become a slave. Herbert Spencer, a famous psychologist, said if men use their liberty in such a way as to surrender their liberty, 
are they therefore any the less slaves? He says all the barbarisms of the past have their types in the present. All the barbarisms of the past grew out of certain dispositions. Those dispositions may be weakened, but they are not extinct, and so long as they exist, there must be manifestations of them. What we commonly understand by command and obedience are the modern forms of bygone despotism and slavery. To whatever extent the will of one is overborne by the will of the other, to that extent the parties are tyrant and slave. John Stuart Mill, a philosopher, said there have been and may be again great individual thinkers in a general atmosphere of mental slavery. And again, referring to Aristotle and Plato, these thinkers believed in slavery and saw it so natural part of society, but yet many people would consider these guys to be the founders of philosophy itself. John Stuart Mill continues and he says, By selling himself for a slave, he abdicates his liberty. He foregoes any future use of it beyond that single act. He therefore defeats in his own case the very purpose which is the justification of allowing him to dispose of himself. He is no longer free but is thenceforth in a position which has no longer the presumption in its favor that would be afforded by his voluntarily remaining in it. The principle of freedom cannot require that he should be free not to be free. And that kind of dispels this idea of voluntary enslavement. It's like saying that you're a slave to nature or a slave to God or you know a slave to freedom. It just doesn't work uh, because it's a contradiction of terms. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Ezra Haywood said a similar idea with the voluntary and involuntary slavery and talking again about history. I mean, really, these quotes go on and on. Albert Herbert said, it must be borne in the mind that the unfailing distinction between direct and indirect compulsion, as I have employed the words, is that in one case, indirect compulsion, the person in question gives his consent, and in the other case, direct compulsion, his consent is not required from him. It is no answer to say that the weakness of men is such that their own consent is a mere form. Our effort in all cases must be to build up sufficient strength in the man so as to make his consent a real thing, real consent. What is he choosing? Is he choosing it because he's indoctrinated into choosing it, or is he really choosing it for himself, right? Angelina Grimke, a very famous abolitionist, said the doctrine of blind obedience and unqualified submission to any human power, whether civil or ecclesiastical, is the doctrine of despotism. Samuel Taylor Coleridge said slaves by their own compulsion and mad game, they burst their medicals and wear the name of freedom graven on a heavier chain. A willing slave is the worst of slaves, his soul is a slave. I mean, really can go on and on. You got quotes from Lizzie M. Holmes, Mary Wollstonecraft, Larkin Rose, Charles Lennox, Raymond, that's another abolitionist, Etienne de la Bozzi, Manly Palmer Hall, Benjamin Tucker, William Godwin, and there you have it. If you want to check out more of those quotes, feel free, but uh, we can go on all day talking about this idea of mental slavery or internal slavery. It's bombarding, and yet, who is talking about it? This is the root to all slavery, and I think it's time that many people in all sorts of different fields of academia, and really just the general public, comes to understand these ideas, because if they ever want to be free, they have to realize that they cannot point the finger to people in charge, in power. Perhaps they need to point the finger and look at themselves. Thank you for watching this part of the docu-series Slavery Gone for Good. Be sure to watch our other parts for a more deep understanding as to the nature of truth and action in its fullest extent. If you want to learn more and hear more quotes that have not been discussed in this video, be sure to buy the book Slavery Gone for Good Black Book Edition. This is the most important work in history, and you are part of that work. Do not forget it. As Frederick Douglass, former slave and abolitionist said, 
knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave.